No. Good. So the nice thing about giving a token a synchrotron, you don't need to introduce what a synchrotron is. So I'll just uh, show you two um, pictures here. The top one is Soleil and the bottom one is uh, Max 4. And you can see that we also have snow sometimes, but of course not for as long as you do. So as uh, Karina already said, I'm going to talk about infrared imaging and uh, with the uh, six decades of dynamic range. But first, I wanted to show you uh, and introduce you the people who are contributing to all these work that you will see today. So at the, at the Smith Beam line, we have uh, some permanent staff working uh, as scientists on biospectroscopy, Christoph Sant. High pressure physics is Francesco Capitani, who has uh, also a PhD student who is actually finishing her studies right now. Uh, Stefan Lefrancois is our, our engineer, and he also has a student who who he's working with on uh, all kinds of engineering problems related to beamline design and, uh, and construction. And we also have uh, some students, uh, Johannes Solheim, Pauline Fazino, and of course, you probably know Paul Dumas who was heading the beamline before me, and he's still with us as a, an emeritus. But uh, it's not only these people who are contributing to our scientific out direct scientific output, it's also some associated groups who work very closely with us from uh, various fields, astrophysics, high pressure physics, polarimetry, biospectroscopy, and even computer science. So I'm going to show some of their work as well today to show you what the, the expert groups are doing uh, in Soleil. But first, I wanted to make a point on infrared spectroscopy because uh, this is, as you all probably know, it's not a new thing. And uh, I had some fun of trying to find the first infrared spectrum. I don't think I did, but this one, what you see is from 1903. And this is actually the, the spectrum of the initial uh, thermal emitters. But this also means that this uh, almost 120 years of experience behind infrared spectroscopy gives us enormous amount of knowledge about the molecular vibrations, about electronic structures. And we have huge, huge databases to refer to when we are doing our studies. And uh, so also to comment on why six decades of dynamic range, what you will see here is a little video that shows uh, what happens when you zoom out six orders of magnitude from a given uh, uh, specimen. <laughs> and in this case, we were starting with a, with a person and we are going to zoom out to about hundred kilometers. This is six orders of magnitude. Of course, we are not doing this in Smith, in Soleil, but we zoom between the centimeter and the nanometer scale. So let's say about a few tens of nanometers to a few centimeters. And this is six uh, orders of magnitude. We do this with uh, multiple instruments, which I'm going to show you. And we are combining all kinds of IR sources, of course, focusing very strongly on the, on the synchrotron and uh, adapting all our instruments to the synchrotron. So the, the instruments that, uh, that we currently use. They go from uh, imaging microscopes in the far field, one we have from Agilent, to confocal microscopes. Uh, then we have subdiffraction techniques, which are some of them are very new. The optical photothermal uh, infrared uh, microscope that, uh, that is a real workhorse these days at the, at the beamline. And uh, we just recently acquired an AFM, which we coupled to the synchrotron. So I'm going to show a couple of uh, examples from all these uh, techniques. And the first one I want to show you how this uh, several centimeter imaging happens is, uh, is my fingerprint actually. This is just for show. So I'm going to show you some science here also, but uh, this is the optical image of my fingerprint and this is the infrared image. So this is a one megapixel IR uh, hyperspectral data set, which we recorded. And uh, so the, the microscope itself is very useful for sample screening or, or large samples, which come very often from astrophysics. We do some metrology and of course, biological studies. Biologists, they all like to work with images instead of spectra, but uh, we can very often convince them that hyperspectral imaging is even better than spectroscopy or, or imaging alone. The, the system, was uh, purchased for implementing uh, infrared tomography, which I'm going to show you a couple of examples too. But first, uh, metrology study. And this is a, a very, how to say, a very cool tech project. This is in, in collaboration with the Institute Astrophysique in Orsay. 
who are building a spectrum, uh, spectrometer, an imaging spectrometer for a, a Jupiter mission that is going to launch in 2023 and will arrive to Jupiter a few years later. And it will do all kinds of studies around Jupiter about uh, the magnetosphere, the, the, the properties of the, of, the, of the system. And it will also visit several of the moons of Jupiter. And so the, the spectrometer is called the MAGIS and it's an IR imaging spectrometer. The way it works is, uh, is uh, based on a fabri perot interferometer, which is, uh, you probably know, that uh, two parallel plates, if you shine light on them, you get multiple reflections. And then in certain wavelengths is going to transmit and the other wavelengths is going to act as a, as a filter. And these wavelengths, they depend on the, on the wavelength itself, the, the thickness of your, of your fabri perot filter, the refractive index and, as, and the angle of the light. So if you design this in a little bit different way, let's say you make a wedge, then uh, different parts of the filter are going to transmit different wavelengths. And if you put a, an array detector behind, then you have an imaging spectrometer basically. And if you put Jupiter behind, then you have a very cool imaging spectrometer. So what we did uh, with IAS, we helped them characterize the filter that is actually installed on this satellite or on this, uh, on this uh, uh, spectrometer. And uh, so this is how it looks. It's uh, about five, three, four, five centimeter large. I forget the exact size, but it's a, it's a physically large object. And so what you will see here on the bottom left is the, how the spectrum changes if you change the position of the, on, the, on the filter. I'm going to play it again because I knew that the first time is going to be uh, lagging. So, okay, second time also. But anyway, you, you get the idea that the transmission depends on the position as well. And therefore you can do a, do kind of like a non-interferometric non or non-FTIR uh, data collection. So based on the pixels that you collect, you will get the, the corresponding spectral uh, signatures. And so this uh, has been, the, the characterization has been finished. The spectrometer is completed and now it's being installed on the, on the satellite. And I guess it's waiting for launch next year or, or in 2023, I forget uh, what is the exact date. So as I said before, the, the system, this imaging system was uh, purchased for implementing IR tomography. I don't know how many people do tomography in the room or in the audience, but uh, this is a very well-known technique. Uh, a little bit less known, is uh, if you do spectral tomography, which is of course possible in synchrotrons, it's not quite possible in hospitals. But if we uh, record the projections, not only on one wavelength, but uh, several different wavelengths, then we not only can reconstruct the physical uh, three-dimensional position of these objects, but we can also tell what they're made of. And so this is what we, what we implemented at uh, Smith. This was first shown by some colleagues in ALS and the SRC, yes, the, the in, in Wisconsin. And so we, we did the implementation and it works really nicely. So I'm going to show you just one video and uh, I will tell you what the reason for that is. And so what you will see here, the gray uh, part of the data is X-ray tomography and the colored parts are infrared tomography data sets and we overlaid them. So the, the benefit is that you get the density, high resolution information and the chemistry at a lower resolution, but you can still overlay and see where the, let's say the, the water is uh, accumulated in this sample or where the CH is accumulated and all, all kinds of correlations can be made in three dimensions. So the reason why I cannot really show you much more is because the samples that we are using this on is, uh, is the Ryugu Hayabusa 2 uh, samples, which came back from space in last Decem December. And we cannot show before the first publications, we cannot show the data. But if you go to this website, then, uh, then you can watch a very cool uh, video from the group of Rosario Brunetto from IAS, who are actually working on these samples right now. So I, I made this little link for you to uh, easily remember uh, or easily write it down. It's five minutes, but it's a, it's a bit more informative than just showing you this uh, fancy video. And soon the papers are coming out, so then we can actually talk about it. Okay, so then if we go to diffraction-limited confocal microscopy, 
then we can have, of course, multiple applications. And I'm going to show you only one field, which is high pressure science. And um, the reason why we need very uh, high spatial resolution for this kind of studies is that uh, you can see on the, on the right here, if we make a sample in a diamond anvil cell that creates the pressure. So here, here, is a, here is a typical diamond cell where you have two diamonds and in between a little cavity that contains all kinds of things, contains your sample, contains a, a little piece of ruby for pressure measurement and some pressure transmitting medium. Then you end up, depending on the pressure you want to create with a, a small cavity, and then you need really tightly focused beam to actually be able to measure the sample and the reference at the same pressure. So one of the, one of the uses or one of the use cases for this kind of uh, uh, studies, actually many people say that this is the holy grail of high pressure science, is the metallization of hydrogen, which is uh, directly, direct, directly related to planetary science. So in the cores of the, of the big gas planets, you're supposed to find metallic hydrogen. I, I'm not an expert, so I, I cannot say whether, whether this is only a theory or it's a fact. But nevertheless, it's a very interesting system for solid state physicists as well. So there are all kinds of implications if hydrogen can be metallized, and uh, it can be. And uh, that was uh, proven at, uh, at Smith. So what you see here on the top, these are visible images of this uh, diamond anvil cell with a tiny, tiny hole in the middle. So this hole is uh, about four micrometers. So now you can also appreciate why you need a diffraction limited focus to be able to put through as, my, as many photons as possible. And you see that the pressures are really enormous. So 300 or even up to 430 gigapascals. And what you, what you see invisibly is the, the closing of the gap of the diamond. The, the hydrogen as well becomes black. So nothing is transparent anymore in the, in the visible. And this is what you want to measure. Right? You want to measure a band gap closure when the sample becomes metallic and it doesn't transmit light anymore. And uh, that's exactly what happens and what we measured. So I guess the easiest uh, graph to understand here is on the top right, uh, where you can see the, let's say the integrated intensity uh, as, a fact, as a function of pressure and around 425 GPA, it suddenly drops down to zero and then it can be recovered and the gap reopens. So the group who was uh, working on this was, uh, is from SEWA, Polly Bear's group. And uh, this, uh, this just came out, I think, uh, last year. So, so it's very nice now. Of course, they are moving forward. They are trying all kinds of uh, uh, measurements with the deuterium, for example. And uh, you can expect more papers out, coming out from this uh, uh, another high pressure example is the work of uh, Anna Celeste, who is our PhD student on high pressure. And uh, she works uh, with Francesco, she works on metal organic frameworks under pressure. I guess everybody knows roughly what metallic frameworks, uh, metal organic frameworks are. You have uh, some kind of metal that has ligands and then a linker that uh, creates a weird, very porous structure, crystal structure, uh, which are really, uh, versatile, so you can change the linkers, change the metals, and build all kinds of different uh, structures, which are good for different applications, including gas storage for, let's say, hydrogen, hydrogen fuel storage, CO2 capture, catalysis, or even gas separation. So their work, uh, they used a metal organic framework, which is called MIL-101, which is a chrome, chromium uh, uh, containing uh, metal organic framework. And depending on the linkers, so you can, you can put all kinds of uh, uh, molecules, of course, but that changes the names as well, and the structures. Depending on the linkers, you can create pore diameters between 24 to 29 angstroms or 29 to 34 angstroms. And then when you crystallize them, this is how they, they line up together. So the questions that uh, one can ask in relation with those applications is, for example, what is the, the mechanical stability? or how does the structure changes if, for example, if, uh, if you, we use it as a catalyst under pressure, because catalysis usually goes under pressure. So this is a uh, high pressure uh, infrared questions. And one of the studies that uh, they did 
or we did is uh, to, to investigate what happens if we use different pressure transmitting media or if we use uh, molecules that can intercalate into the structure because for example in catalysis this is an essential essential uh, requirement so it turns out that uh, if we use uh, sodium chloride which is a typical uh, pressure transmitting medium for infrared measurements because it's transparent in the ir then the the structure breaks down very quickly around 0.4 gigapascals and it's not recoverable if on the other hand we use silicon oil or nujo then uh, the stability of the structure increases because the, the, these molecules, they are smaller molecules, and they intercalate into these pores that I was showing you on the previous slide. And uh, they kind of sustain the pressure that we are putting on the, the system with the diamond cell. So you can see that uh, these uh, OH vibrations, they show it very nicely that uh, they don't disappear. And after reaching 13, uh, 0.2 gigapascals or 15 gigapascals, we can recover the structure. So if we decrease the pressure, then everything comes back uh, to the almost to the initial state. What we also can see is that the, the these things that we intercalate into the into the moth, they interact with the system because the the OH peaks they change their frequency. So this is very important for catalysis, and uh, in the next step they did the following uh, logical step, which is uh, to intercalate instead of these uh, small molecules, they put uh, palladium in the pores. So what you see on the left is a, a TEM image of these uh, MOF samples, and you see the little black dots, they are palladium uh, nanoparticles inside the MOF, which are really nicely distributed around, I don't know, 1.8 nanometer size. And uh, with the X-ray diffraction, we could very nicely see that uh, they're well dispersed, and there is no aggregation, so we don't see large, uh, large nanoparticles. So then the, the infrared uh, and the X-ray combined, they also show what happens if you have different uh, percentage of loadings in these catalysts. In this, uh, this study, they studied 20%, 28%, and 35.8% uh, loading. And uh, both from the X-rays and the IR spectroscopy, we, they could conclude that uh, the, the volume change of the unit cell, uh, depending on the loading, of course, uh, it becomes higher and higher pressure, uh, or, or uh, let's say stop cha stops changing at higher and higher pressure, and eventually it breaks down. So these are not recoverable experiments. We were really trying to destroy it, and of course we succeeded. But the important information that gets out of this is that if we have only the, the pure metal organic framework, then it's quite low uh, stability in terms of pressure. And as we load it with the palladium, we can go up even to, let's say, 0 0.25 gigapascals. So again, this is a, a very important uh, information for catalysis because palladium is used in all kinds of uh, catalytic processes, and uh, this will be directly related to applications. Uh, so now I would like to move to subdiffraction techniques that uh, Karina was also mentioning in the introduction. And uh, there are two main groups here. And uh, I, I made this weird slide because they are, how to say, historically uh, reversed. So the first uh, introduction of the, of the subdiffraction techniques were the nano IR machines. And there are two flavors for these. One is the AFM IR, which works uh, in, an, in, in a mechanical detection of an infrared pulse. And uh, the mechanical detection is the heat expansion that the infrared pulse provides to the sample. So we put, a, put an AFM tip on the top of the sample and when the infrared pulse comes, the sample makes a kick and that you can detect with an, with an AFM. Or you can, you can send in a photon and uh, put an AFM tip, which acts as an antenna very close to the surface. And then this system, radiates another photon, so scatters this incoming photon. So the, in this case, you have an optical input and an optical output, not a mechanical output. So one is called AFMIR, and the, one, the other one is called a scattering uh, snob. And uh, they have different um, uh, capabilities. So for example, AFMIR, it produces really good uh, quality information when you have an actual kick. So when you have, when you have volume 
that can give you an expansion. So for example, AFMIR on graphene is not great because it's a one atomic layer. So you cannot expect a, a huge expansion there. And on the other hand, the SNOM, it, uh, it behaves uh, differently. It gives you very good data when you have very good scatterers, which fortunately are, for example, 2D materials. So if you combine the two, then of course you can, you can reach all kinds of samples, but it doesn't mean that you cannot do tricks to, to uh, use either one of these to, to inspect the non-favorable materials. And so if we go historically, then the next uh, technique is uh, called optically probed phototermal infrared uh, spectroscopy or microscopy. And this is very similar to the AFMIR, except instead of the AFM tip, we use a laser. And so what it means that you, re you remove a, a, a piece of complexity from this system, which is the AFM, because uh, measuring AFM is not always uh, trivial, but uh, doing microscopy is much more how to say uh, easy and in this case what we what we do we have a, a probing laser instead of the afm tip which is a, a cw laser and uh, we have a tunable uh, qcl or a, or a broadband source but the requirement is that it has to be passed and this pass structure is transferred onto this uh, cw intensity it modulates the the probing uh, laser so we are still diffraction limited in a way, but instead of the infrared diffraction limit, now we have to consider the green or whatever the, the probe wavelength is, that diffraction limit. And therefore we are way, way below the infrared uh, resolution, which is great because we can look at smaller things. So I'll show you first uh, a few uh, studies that we did with the phototermal infrared. And then after that, I will go to the nano IR. So the first uh, example is actually from Lund, from Oksana, uh, and uh, she was uh, doing uh, Alzheimer, or she is doing Alzheimer's research, combining the synchrotron and the phototermal infrared. And so, what you see here on the on the gray figure is the visual or the visible image of a neuron, which then she imaged with the different uh, wavelength laser, laser uh, lines, which are either uh, for the uh, protein alpha helix or the beta sheet uh, uh, frequencies. And then by combining these, she could really nicely see how, where the protein aggregation happens because uh, Alzheimer research is very much related to amyloid beta uh, aggregation. So that's what you can see here on these, uh, on these ratio images. And then of course, uh, this was all validated with the, with the synchrotron data, which we have a lot. Uh, of based on, on her research and also other people, and also based on the non synchrotron infrared uh, spectroscopy, which is, I mentioned, is uh, more than 100 years uh, accumulated. So, this was, uh, this was very well appreciated. We got a really nice uh, cover image out of this on a, on a very good journal. But then uh, we also looked at different samples. Uh, and in this study, uh, the group who was uh, working on this was looking at degradation of uh, pigments in paintings. And this painting was a, was a Van Gogh. I think it's not the nicest one, but when you have a Van Gogh, you don't complain. Although you really have to pay attention because what happens is that uh, uh, Van Gogh was using pigments, which are photosensitive. So if you're planning to buy a, pic a painting for a couple of hundred million euros, be careful because in a few hundred years, you might lose some colors out of it. So he actually had uh, some lilies that are now white, but they used to be blue. And imagine that you have a really nice big painting in, uh, I don't know, 1850, I don't know when Van Gogh painted uh, these, and uh, 200 years later, the lilies are white. So it's, a, it's an important, uh, important problem to understand and to conserve it if it's possible. So here on the top, you see samples. So when we say that we measure the Van Gogh painting, we are talking about 100 micron pieces of Van Gogh painting. Unfortunately, they didn't bring the, the actual thing to the beamline. But nevertheless, these are the samples. And uh, then they took out, uh, uh, they sectioned this. So, so in this uh, uh, bottom figure, you see already the, the thin section of, the, of this uh, sample. And so here, again, they, they combined the synchrotron to identify the main building blocks of this, uh, this chip, paint chip. And uh, since it was uh, embedded in epoxy, they very nicely see the epoxy resin around it. 
and then in the in the actual uh, sample they could they could make out you know different uh, building blocks for example cellulose or proteins or epo the epoxies the, the the resin but all kinds of uh, other building blocks and uh, after this they they went in with the optir and uh, now again we are talking about much higher resolution so instead of i don't know 510 micron resolution we have 500 nanometer so a smaller area which from the same uh, same part of the of the paint or the or the sample could be examined at much higher resolution so now they could really build high resolution maps for all kinds of uh, uh, components like the oil or the lead white that is the how to say the matrix and they could also find the the spectra of this pigment which is called geranium lake and they could identify it based on a reference so they know now how this was more or less a methodology paper but they know now how to understand this problem and uh, this is as usual always the first step is uh, to build the toolbox in uh, understanding how to mitigate the, the effects so maybe in the future we can make better pigments that uh, that won't won't fade but still give the nice colors so now i'm uh, arriving to the to the afm part and what you see here is uh, is our newest addition to the beamline uh, it's a a near spec uh, instrument which is a kind of a modular tool that we try to uh, build in a way that uh, we can do all kinds of uh, experiment so the main focus is uh, scattering snow uh, which we have two flavors of we can do imaging with a qcl source in a in a limited bandwidth and we can also do uh, broadband spectroscopy in a very wide bandwidth but of course when you're talking about hyperspectral maps you always lose time while you're measuring the spectrum so in in this case we have lower how to say lower number of pixels that we can access in a in the same time and uh, it also has a, a module for uh, tip enhanced trauma scattering and uh, as we speak we are working on uh, qcl based snom spectroscopy and also the phototermal afm implementation which is the other uh, nano ir technique and so what i will show you here they are the data comes from two two parts the first part is when we tested the system and the second part is when we actually bought it so what you see here is uh, is one of the tests uh, we did some measurements on a, a microelectronic device where they implanted silicon with uh, with some kind of uh, dopants and uh, this changes of course the the conducted conductivity of this uh, chip which we could see very nicely if we recorded the the broadband hyperspectral maps so here on the bottom left you see let's say an integrated image of the of the optical signal and then if we sp split it up for different wavelength ranges so between 700 and 1000 wave number wave numbers we get information about the doping levels and uh, if we correlate this with let's say the silicon oxide peak then we have uh, information about the chemistry so here we can directly compare or correlate the chemistry with the doping so this is a very powerful uh, thing in in uh, nanospectroscopy then uh, this these these data are already with the with the installed system that we have purchased in uh, last year i guess and uh, we were testing how much is the sensitivity and uh, in this case we are we were measuring two dimensional perovskite uh, flakes and you see that uh, from 12 nanometer flake we can get a quite a strong uh, or quite good signal to noise ratio spectrum but even with the six nanometer uh, perovskite we we still see those peaks we can follow very tiny amounts of uh, of material and sometimes people talk about when, when i talk about this sometimes they say okay but uh, six nanometers this is a lot of material you can do this in a grazing incidence uh, measurement or so but they forget that uh, in a grazing incidence your your sampling volume is actually very big so although you might have a very thin film you're measuring it over a long distance and here we are measuring a very thin film in a 10 nanometer spot or 20 nanometer spot so the amount of material is really really small 
And then we went further. We had some meta-organic framework layers, which were only three nanometer thick. And we, we still see very nice chemical signature. We also have things that we couldn't explain, but this may be just an artifact uh, for the measurement. And then, of course, we wanted to do some, uh, some cooler studies, not just uh, showing that we can measure stuff. So the first one that, uh, that actually was not with the synchrotron, but with uh, just using the lasers, uh, was a, a nan on carbon nanotubes. So the samples look like this. They, they have, uh, let's say, silicon. On top of silicon, there's always silicon dioxide. And uh, we put uh, uh, hexagonal boron nitride flakes and then overlaid nanotubes on them. So you can see that the, 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 on the topography, you can really nicely identify the nanotube as it goes from the silicon surface to the, to the hexagonal boron nitride. And of course, we can determine the, the thickness and we know which ones are the, the metallic and which ones are the semiconducting tubes. And then if you record the optical phase from the scatter light, infrared light, then you get uh, this kind of uh, uh, waves along the nanotube. So what happens, or actually I don't have a figure for this, what happens is that the, the tip, as it approaches the nanotube, it uh, couples in the infrared light and uh, launches a phonon inside the nanotube, which is reflected either from the end of the nanotube or from a, from a, a boundary, let's say between the silicon and the uh, hexagon boron nitride. And it reflects on this boundary. And when, when it comes back, then it couples out and you can measure it. So as you go, you have constructive and destructive interferences depending on the position. And then you get these beautiful, I don't know, beads on the, on the nanotubes. And uh, so the interesting uh, part is that you can do this on different wavelengths and uh, the, this, the wavelength of the phonon changes and you can measure this in physical space because of the interference. But uh, more than that, uh, on certain wavelengths, you have uh, either on the silicon dioxide or on the boron nitride, the, the nanotube uh, disappears or the, the backscattered light disappears. And the reason for this is that it couples with the phonon of this corresponding uh, substrate, either with the silicon dioxide or with the boron nitride, and then you just don't see it. So you can scan through the whole wavelength range of your QCL in this case, and you can measure the plasma dispersion, and then you can plot it really nicely. So you can, you can see that uh, if you, it, we, in this case, we did two kind of data analysis. We did the automatic with Fourier transformation, and then also we counted the beads and the distance between them, and they overlay really nicely, and uh, they disappear, in this case, at the, at the phonon of the silicon, the silicon uh, dioxide. So if you plot this in a less, fancy way, then we can actually plot the spectrum. And so this is how it looks like. The, the, the red uh, data is, uh, is the FFT uh, data analysis, and the, and the pink one is the measured by, by hand. And then it really nicely fits a uh, uh, harmonic oscillator model. So it's very well explainable. And the, the effect arises clearly because of the, the, the coupling with the silicon dioxide phonon. Oh, okay. So here <laughs> is a, another, and this is the last example from, uh, from which is really, really fresh. It was uh, uh, the, the beam time finished yesterday. So you can appreciate the, the details and, the, and the, the, the presentation, I think. I don't know why this, uh, this thing is on the screen in the middle, but in any case, uh, the, the study was aimed at uh, hexagonal boron nitride, which is uh, it's a very important material recently, at least in the last decade. Uh, it's, a, it's a large band gap uh, insulator, but it has all kinds of weird and crazy uh, photon, uh, nanophotonic uh, properties. And so it can be expected that uh, it will be used for, for infrared devices, for as a single photon emitters or building blocks of these very fancy and very fashionable heterostructures with graphene or other materials and all kinds of other things. So there's a, a very nice review that was uh, published two years ago. And this, this picture is from there. But uh, what we did, and again, I, I'm going back to, the, to our tests two years ago, 
uh, we just tried out different kind of samples and we tried to reproduce uh, literature data. This, this uh, uh, picture on the right is uh, from ALS where they measured the phonon dispersion bands of uh, hexagonal boron nitride. And they, as you go close to, to the zero line, which is the edge of a flake, you see that the, that the phonons really change their, their frequency. And with a lower, uh, how to say, lower resolution scan, we kind of confirm this. So this was kind of a decision factor for us, whether we can see the same type of things at our beam line. So we, we knew that it, everything is working well. But then last week came a, came a group from um, Lille, uh, who were measuring also boron nitride and their expertise is how to grow it. Because uh, when we are talking about applications, of course, you cannot go there with your scotch tape and just exfoliate on your LED light bulb or whatever it is. So you need to learn how you grow things and what is the effect of the growth. And uh, you can see that from the SCM on the left here, it's very clear, and this is known, that, uh, that you don't always grow single monolayers, but because of uh, several reasons, you go terraces. So here you see these triangular pyramids that are kind of growing up. These are multiple growing number of layer uh, boron nitride uh, islands. And so what they measured, is, you can probably identify here, is this little L feature, which is also here. So they measured this part of the sample, and uh, I would say the, the thickness is around 1.5 nanometers. So I, I, I go back to the here. Here we had a 12 nanometer uh, jump, but here they really aimed at few layer uh, boron nitride uh, systems. And down here, I'm showing you the, the optical amplitude, which, which is the integrated optical amplitude. But then if we park the AFM in the center, then we can get uh, the spectra and we can get the, the two phonons, the out-of-plane and in-plane phonons of the boron nitride. And uh, the very interesting thing that uh, they have discovered is that when you grow the samples, then the in-plane phonon is, uh, is always much, much weaker than what you would expect from exfoliated samples. So this can be due to stacking. It can be due to intercalation of, of things between the layers, but it certainly has a very strong uh, uh, effect on the applications or it needs to be understood why, why we have this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, effects before we can produce high quality uh, boron nitride layers. And so this is uh, all that I wanted to show you today. I put up this uh, figure just as a last one that there are many IR beam lines in the world. And uh, my hope is really that Lund is going to get one at some point. So thank you very much for the attention. And uh, if you have any questions, then just fire them off. <laughs>